I V M. Hopefully, by the time you're listening to this episode, I'm well entrenched on a sunny beach during my first international vacation in almost two years. I'm literally counting down. But of course, the countdown is interspersed with all the pre-vacay stress feels. Over the years, I've actually learned that, in fact, everyone and everything pretty much manages just fine while you're away, and the world doesn't stop turning. Now comes the hard part. actually turning off work when you're away from it how many of us wait and wait and wait for the vacation but by the time we actually manage to unwind it's already time to come back and then we're just not ready to hit the desk again well for starters i'm going to try really hard to keep my phone away as far as possible and if you have any tricks up your sleeve on how to successfully tune off please share your secret It does remind me of that time when we were on our annual trip to the US and about a week into the holiday we get that dreaded call from our restaurant manager that there's been a fire at the restaurant. Okay, let's keep that story for another day. Actually, I have no idea why I just brought that up. So this seems like a great time to take a quick break before I welcome my guest for today. Whether you're an established sports person or a budding one or simply a sports enthusiast, join us. Tanvi and Shlok. We are two passionate pro badminton players talking policy, mindset and everything sport. So tune in to the Millennial Athlete every Monday only on the IVM Podcast Network. Trust us, it's going to be lit. Welcome back to this episode of This Round is on Me. Raised in Singapore and now based in London, Suki Menon is an unstoppable young force that has left a powerful impact on the world. Theatrically known as Suki Singapura, she's the first ever burlesque performer from Singapore. She's been striving for Asian representation and women's empowerment through her performing art. She's also a Netflix star who shot to prominence after appearing on the popular 2019 docu series Singapore Social. Suki, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you join me today. Wow, what a build up! Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. <laughs> So um Suki you're born to an Indian father and a British mother and grew up in Singapore um truly a third culture kid what was <laughs> life growing up for you and you know how did these diverse cultures play a role in in what you do today Oof, I mean where do I start um yeah it was definitely an eclectic upbringing you know I kind of my dad always said that I had the best of both worlds but i always felt like actually you know when i was a kid i felt so out of place i'm like this is the worst of both worlds you know um cuz growing up i never felt like i fit in to be fully indian or fully british or fully indian singaporean it was like a tricultural melting pot and um yeah that really shaped who i became because i guess when you don't have an identity you learn to carve out an identity and that's really where my journey started was in the whole tentative steps that began because i was uh, i guess you call it now third culture kid and that really caused me to go on this journey of discovery that started with vintage fashion somehow ended up with burlesque and then a netflix show and that all emanated from from that upbringing as you say that's really interesting i mean you know that you you almost couldn't um you know identify yourself with any one particular sort of culture and it it sort of led you to this uh i read that you were trained in classical ballet as a child and you know loved acting and singing and you played the violin um and you even taught yourself the piano but then you ended up with a job in it like <laughs> how did that happen <laughs> and um you know but i mean sort of how did these sort of pursuing these creative interests um you know end up with where uh you know what you ended up doing and of course uh with a with a little uh segue into IT um okay so in my defense <laughs> i am a <laughs> i am a geek so i kind of love that i was in IT i mean i love technology um i'm a massive nerd i have a science brain so i i did love being in technology being in IT doing sciences but the the fact of the matter is you're right when i was younger um i was trained in classical ballet from the age of of 7 um 6 or 
but it was really as an extracurricular activity. And then I had this affinity for the arts and dancing, music, singing. I was so theatrical as a child. And all my, I remember all my teachers just saying to my parents, oh, she could be a protege, you know? And I, one year I did two violin grades in one year, which was like unheard of in the school because I just had this natural affinity. But unfortunately, I am from an extremely conservative traditional family. And those Indian Asian values really played a massive prominence in the direction that I went in. Both my parents are doctors. My sisters have ended up in the medical profession. So even though I was, I was kind of, um, yeah, so obviously naturally, I guess naturally talented or was showing natural talent growing up, I was kind of hardballed into choosing sciences. And mm-hmm. so I could do sciences. I was very good at sciences, but it wasn't my love. And so I, at the time, I basically did what my family kind of wanted me to do. So I ended up majoring as a science at university um, and then sort of taught myself IT and ended up landing um, a great job um, in, in IT, just working with virtual servers and Linux-based operating systems. If anyone's a nerd, um, you're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah. Just being a total dork. But I guess, you know, even as I'm talking to you right now and you guys won't be able to see this, but I'm literally gesticulating in the most flamboyant way. And that's pretty much what I was like in the office. And I knew that I'm sitting here in this corporate (laughs) office with all of these men and I'm, I'm waving my hands around as I'm describing things like as if they're floating through butter and, (laughs) and I'm just thinking, this isn't what I want to do. This isn't who I am. This isn't within my soul. And, um, Growing up, as I mentioned, to find my place through that tri-culture, I discovered vintage fashion because vintage fashion, it didn't matter what you looked like, what your skin color was, where you were from. It was about this pinup aesthetic. So I really Mm -hmm. got into that and I found a place and a comfortability within that space. Um, And then through that, you kind of can't go into vintage fashion without hearing about burlesque. Mm -hmm. And that was like the penny drop for me because, you know, Things like sexual empowerment and, and women's bodies were such a taboo growing up. I mean, we really didn't discuss anything like that. Um, it was just absolutely not spoken about. Um, and here was this art form which was appealing to the flamboyancy, which was about movement and women taking control of their bodies. And it was artistic and it didn't matter if you didn't have a, a professional training in, in dance. I'm just like, wow, I want to give this a go. Um, So it was kind of like inevitable at that point. And then it literally was, I mean, you say, how did I go from IT to burlesque? I mean, (laughs) I honestly, I look back and I'm like, how the hell did I do that? But what actually happened was um, a theater down the road for me was opening, auditioning for burlesque artists. It's complete chance. But also I really believe in the universe sending you signs. And so I honestly don't know what possessed me. I literally grabbed my friend. We walked on down to the club and we said, hire us. We are professional burlesque dancers. Give us a job. I wasn't. I had no idea how to do burlesque. I literally just discovered burlesque as a word off of the internet. Um, And yeah, I was, I guess I was so passionate because I knew I wanted to be an artist so badly that I came across with such conviction that they said, start next Friday. Wow. And, and so how long ago was had, this? That was in 2011. So wow. Like, ten yeah, years ago. 10 years ago. And uh, so, my fir- so my entry point to burlesque was frantically having seven days to teach myself the thing off of YouTube to a professional theater with an audience of about 300 people all expecting a professional burlesque artist and I've literally come straight out of an IT office and I'm googling things I'm looking up on YouTube and that was my first performance that was that was the moment and of course it went horribly wrong I mean it went awfully wrong I mean everything got stuck I had no idea how to do a performance um but the spirit of burlesque is is about having fun and not to take yourself seriously. And the audience loved it. So yeah, by day I was, I became an, I was an IT geek like Clark Kent. (laughs) And by night I was a secret show girl at the weekend. And that's how it all began. That's, that's 
that's really funny. And, and I mean, people are always asking me, I made a transition from being a chartered accountant to a restaurateur. I mean, it wow. doesn't sound half as exciting as, as, wow, as your story, so but, cool. um, but I kind of get the similar reaction, which is that how yeah. on earth did you make that sort of completely unnatural um, progression? You know what it is? I think it's like, if you have a passion within your heart, that you have been thinking about, daydreaming about, if you have something within your soul, there's going to come this moment for you, which is like, it will bubble up, bubble up, bubble up. And if that moment meets potential opportunity, then you just have that choice. Either don't go for it, or we only Take have it. one life. Take it. Grab and it I think with, with you everything just, you've got. <laughs> I would encourage you to grab that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. You know, um, just going back to, you talked about uh, coming from a very conservative family, um, yeah. you know, and sort of burlesque being seen um, as a as sort of taboo. Uh, I understand your, you know, your parents were conservative. So how important was family support to you, you know, during the time that you started your career as a dancer? Wow. So conservative is probably understatement of the century. I mean, <laughs> I have the most traditional Indian father. And then my mother, um, she actually went to school with nuns and her mother was the wow. first ever vicar to be ordained in the UK, female vicar the first ever female vicar to do ordained in the UK. So she's hyper-religious. My dad's hyper-strict, super-strict South Indian dad, and they've met in medical college. So if you can even begin to visualize <laughs> that, then you'll understand like a small inkling of how that went down. And um, actually, I'm sad to say that I didn't have any support because at the start of my career, I didn't tell my parents that I had quit my job it did because I literally made that decision do you know I'm going to quit my IT job sink or swim I'm going to make burlesque work that's how much I loved those first moments on stage Mm. like you know what sink or swim I'm going to quit my job and do this and I didn't tell them and I didn't so were you still living at home when you when you no 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 no. so you moved away I I moved away yeah yeah Mm. moved away and um and so I'm like secretly doing this this burlesque career and they have no idea they honestly thought I was still in IT and I can't lie I'm a very I'm very bad at lying I mean I sweat when I when I exit (laughs) shops because I feel guilty even when I haven't taken anything like I'm that level of honesty so they would ask me questions like how's work going and I would be like great yeah work's (laughs) going great and and they would be like how's IT I'd be like no, you know, the IT industry is fantastic. (laughs) Just avoid avoid the answers. Um, And it wasn't until my mom actually got suspicious and and she Googled me. And that's how she found out I was doing that. And so the first time I I even heard about my parents knowing anything about my career was when my mom called me and I picked up the phone and she literally goes, because Singapore obviously isn't my surname, it's my stage name. She picks up the phone and she goes, so Suki Singapore. I'm like, oh. Did your heart just stop? Yeah, my heart stopped. I just, I, then it was, the cat was out of the bag, but the next couple of years were incredibly painful for me because my mm. family absolutely didn't approve. My parents didn't approve. They didn't want me to contact my mm extended family no one was allowed to know it was a scandal it was you know I was bringing shame on the family it was horrendous and so I spent a good few years traveling the world literally by myself and my some of my greatest moments were so bittersweet like when I was invited to Buckingham Palace Mm -hmm. to say thank you for fighting for women's rights I took that trip alone And when I was inducted into the Burlesque Hall of Fame for being a mover and shaker within the industry, I literally had to celebrate that moment alone because I was totally unsupported. I mean, these were the greatest moments of my life and also Mm. the most painful in a sense because I was literally on my own. And it wasn't 
until years later, really only very recently, that my family kind of started to turn a corner. And especially my father, he started to become not more accepting, but definitely more understanding. And, Mm -hmm. you know, but it's, and now I think, you know, I really, there was this moment where I just finished filming Netflix and my, I think it was like or midway through production, I just finished and my dad sent me an email and then the, the title of the email was just Netflix and the content of the email was well done, full stop. And I'm just wow. like, that was like a bit of a moment and it's still a work mm-hmm. in progress, but yeah, no, I was, I was unsupported and it was difficult. And what about your siblings? Cause you mentioned you have sisters, right? Yes, very good, conservative, <laughs> well-behaved individuals. <laughs> so I guess secretly I'm loving what one. you do. <laughs> um, do they love what I do? I couldn't say that they. I don't know if they even know entirely what I do. I mean, mm. I'm sure they have a grasp of what I do. I wouldn't say that. I couldn't say they love what I do. Um, but, you know, maybe one day they'll turn on the TV screens and I'll be there and it'll be unavoidable. <laughs> mm. But, you know, I mean, why do you think there is so much taboo around this? You know, with I feel like with every next generation, you know, I think we are becoming more and more liberal. Um, but right. I'm a parent to an eight-year-old, right? So I... Mm-hmm how should I be approaching this with my daughter, you know, or even the education system for that matter, right? Like, what would you like to see changing as in the next generation or as for a society um, so that there isn't this taboo around, um, you know, burlesque? I'll tell you exactly what it is. And this doesn't just apply to burlesque, but this applies to any daughter in India who maybe doesn't want to do something traditional. This applies to any girl around the world who maybe doesn't want to do something traditional. It can be burlesque, it can be anything. The reason why our parents and our parents' parents have come down so hard on us, yes, there's an element of cultural pride. There is an element of ego. There is an element of family perception. But the other element is fear coming from a place of love. We're frightened that our kids won't be safe if they choose the arts. If they choose Mm -hmm. something traditional, we're frightened they won't be able to survive. We're frightened they're going to get themselves in situations. We're frightened they're going to put themselves in positions where they are subject to predatory men, and that scares us. And so what we do is we aggressively direct them towards a safer profession. But let me tell you, the most dangerous moment in their lives when they pick something that we don't approve of or our parents don't approve of is when the parents don't support them. Mm. It's not when they're doing their career. It's not when they're traveling the world. It's not when they're alone. It's when you don't support them because if they were supported, they would have somebody looking out for them. And so actually the danger doesn't come from them choosing that career. The danger comes from you not supporting it. And so, so I, I guess it's that, it, it's that thing of being, you know, protective. And in that being protective, you're actually being unsupportive because yeah, um, it is. that's just you the know, easier thing to do. Yeah, Everyone looked out for their kids when they chose something that maybe was a little bit different to what we expected, then those kids would be safe. And those kids would feel supported and those kids would flourish and fly. And so I think that there needs to be that shift in, yeah, I understand that you're holding on to generational trauma. And it is generational trauma and fear that you're kind of projecting onto your children. But if we all let that go and we help those kids, then there won't be, you know, there won't be a dangerous environment because everyone will have these kids backs and these kids will be allowed to flourish. I think that's just my biggest piece of advice. But of course, make no mistake, you know, picking the arts, picking something like burlesque, it is a rocky road. There's no denying that being an artist in any faculty is definitely less straightforward because there's so many new uncharted territories that you can't just go to college 
follow the curricula, become a doctor, understand the program. Of course. There are so many unknowns, but I think if you're really passionate about the arts, there's absolutely no way you won't succeed because for sheer volition, you will get there. And you, you know, you've talked about this in, in your videos, right? That it's really about, even for you, uh, overcoming fears and, you know, embracing desire, right? It's, it's such a yeah. I mean, desire just has this um, almost somewhat of a negative connotation uh, in, in our society. Um, but it's so liberating. And, and I think that that really comes across in you know, in what I've seen of, of your, you. um, your art and, uh, and I, and I, it really resonated with me when, when I read that, that in anything, it's not just about, you know, in dance or in art, but in, in really in life, um, the ability, the, the, the sort of, you know, that, that, um, that complete freedom that comes with overcoming fears and, and, yeah. you know, just, um, and accepting and acknowledging what you feel is just so important. Um, and also the understanding that you can always change your mind. Like we're told so often that the only time you can change your mind is just before you go to university or just before mm-hmm. you take on apprenticeship. That's the only time you can change your mind or take a year out to think about things. Right. We're literally told that. And then from that onwards, you have to do full adulting. (laughs) That's the path (laughs) you chose. And you have to endeavor upon that path. But that's actually not true. You know, actually, at any point, if if COVID and this terrible, terrible uncertain times have taught us anything, it's that, yes, these are horrendous times. But look at what you can still achieve, even when you're incapacitated or you have to take a break. Mm. And so I think that that's really taught us and this fast paced society, which is fueled by social media, has taught us a lesson. And that lesson is, is that you can take a pause and reassess and do the complete and utter ultimate U-turn in your career. And I think it's better actually to really give those passions or desires or whatever it is you want to call them, give those dreams a, a chance. Mm. And hey, if you fail, that's okay. If if you fail at any point, that is actually okay because you can U-turn and you can pick up and you can start studying again and you can begin on a completely different trajectory or you can start to tailor the trajectory of the failed vocation into something that is a different direction. And I mean, it's better absolutely. in life to have no, re- no regrets. You know, it's better in life to have no regrets. Yeah, no, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that, you know, even in my profession, I've seen, um, you know, I've seen failure with some of the businesses we've done. And uh, I, 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 it was such a pivotal time for me, because I went through this, and I went through that whole sort of dealing with the ego and, you know, um, Mm. what would people think to a place Mm. where I was just like, I'm so glad I went through this, um, you know, and came out the other side and everything was okay and wow. you know that's yeah. that's basically the, the sort of it gave me so much courage to just you know take things on and, and see where where the cards fall you know and not not worry about um outcomes so much and and I think you know I mean I I remember when I was switching and I was talking to my parents about switching from being an accountant and I'd been I'd been mm-hmm. working as a sort of in in um as a tax consultant for nine years and, you know, I was on a great career trajectory, very stable. And uh, um, and then I was like, I want to get into the restaurant business with my husband. And <laughs> neither of us knew anything about this. Um, and, you know, they were my parents are very liberal, very supportive. And even they were just like, OK, I mean, sure. But are you sure about this? You know, and and I think it just came from that, like you said, you know, that that even with them being so completely open-minded and always having supported my decisions um, that, you know, wanting to give me a sense of stability and not sort of completely rock the boat um, because of a, a whim. Um, but I think that sometimes you do need to uh, act on those whims and like yeah. you said, follow, follow your, your instincts and your desires. So 100%. Um, and it's, it's amazing what you said there about um, ego because ego plays such a big part in the choices that we make. And I think now more than ever, we're starting to dismantle these conversations around ego 
you know, mental health, having, con- having this tight control over life. Because I'm not saying, you know, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that anyone listen to that and go, right, I want to be a paraglider and just <laughs> throw themselves. Like, you know, I mean, obviously you have to know a little bit, like you have to have a small inkling of what you want to do in a small direction. You can't have, I mean, it's not possible to fly. I mean, literally fly. I mean, of course you have, we have ways of flying, but there are some things, but I think um, there's something to be said for allowing yourself those moments in life to metaphorically free fall. Because it's funny how when we actually release ego, when we actually let go, then things fall into place. And we realize that, I don't know whether there's like a law of attraction or you know, a divine plan or whatever it may be. But when you let go of control, ironically, that's often only at that point do things start really falling into place. And I think Will Smith said it best when he said the greatest things in life are on the other side of fear. And that's absolutely Mm -hmm. correct. And I live by that. That's so true. So true. Uh, But, you know, and it's amazing that you finally found... um, you know, you found your calling, you found something that you truly love doing. Uh, but take us through what uh, burlesque really is. You know, I mean, when I um, was introduced to you, I actually, uh, I had to look it up as well to really understand. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course, you know, we've all watched Moulin Rouge and we've, you know, we we know about um Uh, you know, Dita Von and like, but really, um, you know, take us through this. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess it's, it's still subject to a few misconceptions. So burlesque is actually an incredibly old performance art. It originated from 17th century Italian theater. So it's 17th century. So it's ancient. And it was actually a theatrical performance where um, a lowbrow community, so to speak, would put on shows that took fun of the rich high society theater. So say, for example, you had a play where these super rich people would go and they would watch these actors. Well, burlesque was the, was the theatrical um, real people's, like the people on the ground people's theater where they would dress up as those characters and make them do silly things. Um, and the word burlesque literally translates to to poke fun at. So it was, it, was, it was about that. It was a mockery, if you will. And then that started to evolve into um, a tease whereby you know, you'd playfully remove garments. Of course, never any nudity, but it was about that. And then, excuse me, I need to cough. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then as the years went by, um, wait. And then as the years went by, um, it kind of evolved into more showgirl aesthetic, especially Mm -hmm. throughout the 90s. And that incorporated traditional burlesque and this showgirl aesthetic with giant feather fans and these sequins and Swarovski crystals. And it became about that. And it was done by these incredible women, like you say, you know, the Dita Von Teases. Um, But even prior to that in the 1940s, Barbara Young. And that's when it really turned into this feminist art form that you see today, Mm -hmm. whereby women would use burlesque as an expression, a dance form that was an expression where the control of the tease, the control of the routine was in the woman. The woman would choose what she wanted to reveal or what she didn't, or maybe she just didn't reveal anything at all. And that's when the narrative of burlesque went from this very ancient art form of theatrics to this glamorous, empowering, feminist, showgirl, type of burlesque you see today and even now it's kind of evolved from even Dita's era to really an expression for anyone to endeavor upon you know burlesque has no the great thing about burlesque is it has no rules it's not about being the best dancer it's not about having the best costume it's not about necessarily um, being the best in terms of professionally trained It's about how you make the audience feel. It's about how you make people feel. You know, I've seen boylesque because boys can do it too. I've seen burlesque routines where people have dressed as monkeys in monkey outfits or cyborgs and the Mm -hmm. audience have loved it. And and it's just great to see real women um, get on stage and empower other real women 
to feel great about their bodies. Because the other thing about burlesque is it celebrates all shapes and sizes. And I guess right. the biggest misconception about burlesque is, well, is it still showgirls performing to men, right? Right. That's the biggest misconception. And no, 80% of my audience are women. 80% wow. of my audience are women. So it's actually by women, for women, and you can't get more feminist than that. True, very true. And that's really, I mean, that's very interesting that it's, um, you know, it, it's such a high uh, percentage of women who, yeah. who um, enjoy this. I mean, that's incredible. And the rest, are cup- the rest are couples, couples coming to see my show. I remember one moment, this is so crazy. So I actually perform inside of this giant diamond ring. It's a light up diamond ring. It's about six <laughs> foot high. And I bathe in inside the top of the diamond. And um, I'm doing my performance at the Café de Paris in London. Massive, you know, beautiful, gorgeous, plush space. It's a beautiful space. I'm doing this performance. I'm like getting to the penultimate moment of this tease. And suddenly this guy gets down on stage and proposes to his, <laughs> to his girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> right in front of my giant diamond ring. I mean, buddy, if you're going to do it, you might as well do it in style. So <laughs> Doesn't get bigger that, than that. <laughs> doesn't get the rings big enough, honey. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it's, you know, it's very much a On. theatric performance for couples and, and women, and it's incredibly empowering. Amazing. You know, you, you've campaigned extensively for burlesque to be legalized in Singapore. Um, mm-hmm. And it took you, I think, four years. Is that right? To yeah. uh, eventually have your first legal performance in Singapore. So take us through that process. I mean, were you or were you living in the UK at this point, but went back to Singapore? Or, you know, what was the sort of, um, what was your thought behind this? Yeah, that was a really tough journey. And it was stooped in legal gray areas, which there's so many, there's, it's a, so problematic. But essentially, I was in the UK and I was really starting to understand burlesque, get a little bit far in burlesque, really hone my routines. And as I was doing this, um, people started noticing me on Facebook and um, the press in Singapore heard about my story. And they reached out to me and um, it was very much Singapore scandal because I found out that I was the first Singaporean woman to do it professionally, internationally, and in burlesque and, and, and in its entirety. And it hadn't been done before. And so I wanted to kind of come back to Singapore and take it home. And it was that point that I found out that burlesque just absolutely wasn't allowed to be performed publicly and the the narrative behind that was that it was sexual it had the ability to corrupt I guess young minds and it came under the public indecency law something like burlesque a performance that I've just told you can cause a guy to propose to his Mm fiance and women to celebrate themselves was, was was banned under public indecency laws And that just struck the most painful chord with me that this isn't about that at all. You're trying to police a feminist movement and you don't understand what burlesque is. And all you're seeing is the word striptease and you're absolutely coming at it from a point of aggressive patriarchy. And a lot of people say to me, well, why didn't you just continue to perform burlesque internationally? Why did you have to even come back to Singapore? Well, first of all, if I can't perform burlesque in my home, if you can't be free in your own home, then Mm. you're not free at all. You know, no one's free unless we're all free. And I have this incredible, I guess I have a very strong moral compass and I hate to see injustice. I can't bear to see injustice, and especially not when it's about a patriarchy policing female empowerment, because women have the power to change the world, and to repress them in any way is a human rights violation in in my eyes. And so then the next four years, what I did was I literally screamed, shouted, sang about the plight of burlesque in Singapore. Um, And I traveled from country to country, you know, Hamburg, Tokyo. I went to Los Angeles, New York, Paris, London, 
all around the, I mean, I traveled the world and in every single show I spoke about what was going on and I campaigned and I raised awareness and I started a society on Facebook and, and I built up this community and incredible people who were all speaking about this. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I was, I literally was nominated for an Asian Women of Achievement Awards back in the UK. Um, and then that led to an invitation from Buckingham Palace to say thank you for fighting women's right, for women's rights, that it became so, what I can only imagine, so embarrassing for Singapore. For the girl, right. For, so embarrassing. And then, of course, it was the year, it, it's, like I say, timing is everything. I mean, it's not crucial. You'll still make it without timing, but timing helps. It was the year of SG50, our year of independence. And everyone was looking at Singapore to see how we diversified and built up our own culture and celebrated our own artists. And here you are potentially repressing an artist. And it was that year that I I won. And um, on the 31st of January, 2015, I did the first ever public full burlesque performance. That and is incredible. That, thank you. Thanks. And it, it was a moment. I mean, I remember the audience was just electric. Uh, Olga and Gaurav from the SRT brought me in. And I just remember, and then it went on to be Jeanette from Boudoir Noir. And I just remember the, 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 the atmosphere was just so, so electric because the suspense of, is she actually going to do it? And I did. No, I mean, it's a historic um, moment, did. right, for the country. And, you know, I, I, can, I can imagine. And um, it was... It was, I guess, for me, I was obviously thinking about that. But for me, there were so many wins in that. There were so many wins in that, yes, culturally, absolutely, it was a win. Yes, it was a win in terms of women, you know, being empowered and standing up against injustice and taking, reclaiming their bodies. It was a win for that. But it was also very much a personal win because... Here I was, a girl who had been, you know, unsupported by her family and seen as doing something illicit, I guess. And I was taking on this challenge and I'd won. And that just felt like I I looked in the mirror and I felt like, you know what? No one else needs to be proud of you. I'm proud of you. Yeah. And that was just such a powerful moment for me. Um, I mean, I, I, I can't even begin to imagine, but I think that that's, it, you're so you're so absolutely right that you know it's not just about getting that endorsement from everyone around you, but you know feeling that satisfaction of of um, you know achieving something and uh, yeah. and being proud of what you do. Do you think we stand a chance of this ever happening in India? <laughs> oh, you better be ready. It's going to happen in India. <laughs> Well, I mean, well, we can't wait to course. we can't wait to see you here. So I don't know how we're going to make that happen, but um, you know, yeah, I mean that we that's, have a that's we next stop for you. <laughs> we have a couple of things planned coming to India as yeah. soon as it's you know Ooh, the world's exciting. opened up a little bit more. So I'm really excited. You know, I'm excited to just be that person for anyone who has a dream who thinks it's not possible. The, but this burlesque show will be the show for you. But, you know, I mean, beyond your your sort of um, your immediate family and things, did you ever face sort of negativity and, you know, criticism for pursuing your art? Um, and has that ever sort of, you know, how did, how, is, how have you dealt with that? Uh, and I mean, I, I mean, you know, from sort of the public at large or, uh, yeah. um, you know, how do you deal with that and overcome that and continue that's... doing what you're doing? That's really tough because I'm a very sensitive person. I'm like, mm. I have the most gooey set. I mean, the, the center isn't even gooey at this point. It's literally straight up a liquid. Um, so <laughs> I'm extremely sensitive because I'm an empath. So I really, in the same vein that I love to help people and I will literally go out of my way to try and help anyone in need, no matter who it is. It can be a stranger on the street. I'll try and help that person. Um, in that same vein, I'm very sensitive Um, and you know, the world is cruel. It can be cruel. It can be beautiful, but it can also be cruel and people can be cruel. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, yeah, I think it's been difficult because burlesque is controversial. There's, there's no mistake about it. 
until I guess everyone understands that it's not really about burlesque, it's about women taking control of their bodies, until people understand that narrative fully and know what that means and realize that that's actually something that will help us as a society, um, you're still going to face criticism about burlesque. And so that's that's been difficult. But luckily, I guess, if you put on that hat of never speaking about burlesque without speaking about why you do burlesque, right. then I think that's the best way to approach it. And I've always come from this place of female empowerment. So I never say burlesque without saying empowering because that's the story of burlesque. And so that's really helped. And so people have kind of openly embraced that. Um, but I guess other criticism can come from, you know, your, your peers, especially at women. And I'm sure you've experienced this, you know, mm. if you're a woman and you've done something that you really want to do. So you're living your honest, authentic truth and you have succeeded in that honest, authentic mm. truth, <laughs> you're going to get some jealousy. And I think that's so tough. I think more than the public, um, that small proportion of the public that may think what you're doing is controversial. But more than that, I think within your own girl sisterhood, that kind of infighting is probably more painful than anything else. Because I think, and especially if you're doing something that supports women and celebrates women, or like you, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a badass woman with a whole <laughs> restaurant business. Do you know what I mean? If you, especially if you're doing something, you're living the truth, you're wanting to do it to help other people, to provide opportunities, to give other women jobs, you know, to provide platforms, mm. to break those glass ceilings, and you get that from within your own circle or sphere or community, that can be really tough. Um, and I do take that very much to heart, but I think you've just got to stay in your own lane and know that, like with my dad, eventually people will come around. Yeah, and I think absolutely. that I also think that what you do when they come around is argu arguably the most important part of all of this. Mm. Because when they come around, no matter what they've said prior to you, there is a grace and there is good karma in saying thank you and genuinely opening your heart to them. Because as you progress through life, you'll realize that it was never about you. It was always mm -hmm. about them and they're doing their own healing. And I think that if you can literally meet your critics or meet the people that condemned you later down the lane and they say, you know, wow, we, we want to be a part of that. If you can just say thank you, I think that's a really powerful thing. So I never hold negative energy within my space or within my heart you're absolutely and right and, and it's it's so important to keep you know reminding yourself that because it's very easy to kind of um you know yeah it feels good to the, say yeah. it feels good to say well i'm never speaking to you again yeah. <laughs> it feels good oh, to i say told that, you, you know so not, or like yeah, yeah, but yeah we, there's yeah. no need for it you know yeah. the most beautiful thing you can do is just go thank you and it's okay yeah. and i understand you were going through that and i forgive you that's powerful. And hey, you can go, you can forgive somebody and not even tell them you've forgiven them. That's a powerful yeah. thing too. You're, you know, you're absolutely right. Your your costumes, your hairdos, they're famously outlandish. Um, <laughs> how do you go about conceptualizing your performances? And you know, what what sort of what's the inspiration from one oh performance goodness. to the next? Wow. For that how do you keep how to... do you keep it fresh and how do you sort of uh. you know, a very, very overactive imagination helps. <laughs> <laughs> um, you'd probably, ha if you crawled inside my brain, there'd be like swings and wolves and like cats, the moon, <laughs> um, all kinds of things would be going on in that brain. Um, I don't know. I just, I, I very much intuitively express myself as and when. So like if I'm in the mood to, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I, I felt like I just wanted to have no eyebrows. I really mm. felt the need. So I just shaved my eyebrows off. You know what? They grow back. It's fine. And I loved that then <laughs> I got to see a human face without eyebrows. I really liked that. And likewise, you know, sometimes I just want to, if I'm fe I feel confident or I'm feeling, you know, expressive and I feel like the colors of my soul, because it very much comes from my heart, my soul, I feel like the colors of my soul are literally pouring through my hair follicles, then... I want to turn that into a giant wig that like stretches as far as the eye can see. And mm -hmm. so I'll think to myself, you know what? I want to create this. 
because it's not necessarily about creating something for the sake of creating something, it's creating something to make people feel something. And so everything I do has an emotional connection. And a lot of what I do actually, I secretly, sometimes not so secretly if you're <laughs> following me on Instagram, but I write poetry with looks that I create and images I put together. Um, I love poetry. Um, it's kind of like a little sneaky hobby of mine, I guess. Um, I'm a massive fan of William Blake, um, so I, I love poetry. Um, so every look, I have words and music and a soundtrack. And so I guess it's just part and parcel of being an artist. And I never let myself think this isn't possible. So mm. if I'm wanting to create a gown or a stage costume and I think... Or I a five meter like, long hair. Or hair a five <laughs> meter long <laughs> way. Yeah. I'll always think to myself, this is, this is possible. And then, okay, so it's 100% possible. So how do I figure out from it being possible how to actually make it happen? And mm. I swear sometimes the people around me lose their minds <laughs> because they think to themselves oh my gosh this isn't possible and then it is it's always possible it's always possible to do something and I think um creatively you should always push yourself to the most extreme point because then that's when you're saying something that hasn't been said before and you never know who it might resonate with you know it might not even be about the fact that it's a five meter long wig mm. because it wasn't for me it was about having a narrative about the hair extension industry. And I read about shaving. that actually. And I, yeah. I did not know that. I mean, I, yeah. I don't personally use hair extensions, but I know it's a very <laughs> sort of common thing. And, um, you know, I was really amazed about, um, I mean, tell us, tell us the, that sort of story of. Um, yeah. So um, I obviously have loved to color my hair all kinds of different colors and as I'm heading towards film and television I understand that I have now natural colored hair <laughs> um, the role <laughs> warranted but up until this point I've had a plethora of rainbow hair and that's just been because that's how I felt within my heart and my soul and mm -hmm. um, I kind of pushed that to the extreme um, of like creating these looks like I said that were really um, extravagant um, not for the sake of extravagancy but that for the for the sake of creativity. Um, but when I created them, I actually wanted to incorporate something within them, meaning I don't like creating something just for views and attention. In fact, actually in real life, I am chronically shy. I am so socially awkward. It's <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, I will sweat, you know, if I were to meet you in real life, I'd be hiding like sweat because <laughs> I'd be thinking, oh my God, like I'm very shy. Um, so I don't do things for attention. I do things because I need to do things. Mm. And so when I was creating these looks, I wanted to say something more than a rainbow look. And what made me sad was the hair extension industry. And everyone's so, so interested in my hair. And what I didn't want to do would be, would, was people to replicate my look using human hair. Because I think what not a lot of people know about the human hair industry is that's really got a really dark side of it. Where, yeah. yes, okay, there can be, um, you know, ethical human hair extensions, but sometimes it's not ethical. And there's this massive underground black gold hair extension industry. And it just, it's not just in India, it's everywhere where young girls are literally almost farmed for their hair. And they don't receive any, any benefits of, of having their head shaved. They got no financial gain. And then these beautiful virgin hair and is bleached mm. and sold to people that then stick that poor little girl's hair onto their heads so that they can go on a date on a night out it's grotesque mm. it's awful and so I just wanted with my looks to highlight that and so that's why I worked with an incredible ethical non-human hair company to create all of the looks because like I say, just within poetry, everything I want to do, I want to have that narrative of why are you doing it? And I think, I guess that's kind of why my career has evolved. If you were to say, like, what's your career goal? It's not necessarily to be, I obviously have this Asian upbringing of me to be the best. Like, I must be the best. <laughs> I know that I have a competitive it comes with the gene me. pool. Of yeah. course, it comes with the gene pool. I cannot <laughs> deny that I'm not driven. But really, 
when it comes down to it, if you strip all of that back, like what do I want? I just want to make a difference. I just want to make a difference. And I Mm. want to help people, as many people as possible. And that's the reason I do absolutely everything that I'm doing. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's important to know your why at all times. And and I think that a lot of what you're doing is is essentially about educating people, right? It's about, um, you um, know, whether it's I about, guess. I mean, not not sort of, that, that may not be your why, but I think that that's been an outcome of what, you know, what you're doing alongside your sort of creative expression is whether right. it's about the art form or whether it's about, you know, hair extensions or, um, you know, women empowerment. It's just, it's, it's it really is about sort of taking away this superficial understanding yeah. of, of things. And, um, yeah. and yeah, I think that's incredible. I feel like you've come full circle back to your IT life with your <laughs> recently created NFT artwork. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> couldn't let um, go of that could you um no so you know, tell us about that what do you think about nfts and you know is this uh, a, a trend or do you think this is here no, to stay and no, how no, has no, that no. been for you i mean I, I i totally believe in mass mass adoption of the distributed ledger i realize that that's probably the nerdiest thing a show girl has <laughs> ever said but um <laughs> let's face it i'm not an ordinary one <laughs> um, but i absolutely believe in blockchain technology i really believe that Um, the world is going to evolve and we will have this blending of technology and organic. I Mm. think that that's inevitable. And I think that, um, yeah, we had this cool upsurgence, uprising of NFTs, um, which is basically digital art, if anyone doesn't know, um, that comes with its own certificate. It means it's one of a kind. Um, It it uses blockchain technology um, and it allows you to therefore identify that this is the only one in creation. Actually, you know, and that's great because then it gives power back to the artist. So that's fantastic. It's a decentralized network. What that means is there's not one person with the power, and that's fantastic. But Mm -hmm. it also supports something that I believe in, but I'm terrified of, which is the amalgamation of technology and organic, um, which in one sense could be our demise. (laughs) I mean, Mm. in this world where eventually the technology turns on us and locks us out of our own houses and all of that (laughs) stuff. But on the other hand, I think it has the the potential used correctly. And I think it's about us healing as a race, as a human race, before we build the systems. So if we can undergo our own healing so that we're not coming from a place of ego, et cetera, or control or power or destruction, if we can heal that fast enough to to keep up with technology, then technology will come from that place as well. And I think that when you, when then they combine, you, as an artist and as people, we will be able to express ourselves so much more. I mean, we will be able to do hand movements and paint in a virtual world or like a mixed reality medium and life will become so beautiful and exciting. And literally, I'm, I'm, I'm wiggling around as I'm describing this because I'm just like, <laughs> imagine that universe. Like imagine being able to look up in your, you know, into the stars and you see space and it's, it's mixed media and all of that. All these things are The happening. potential is, so, is, is unlimited. Yeah, literally yeah. limitless. And I yeah. love that. And I find it so mm. exciting. But yes, it started, I guess, in terms of mass awareness. Um, Everyone's heard about it now in terms of NFTs. And um, I think that that's the cat out of the bag with people understanding this technology. And I personally love it because for me, it combines my art and my IT brain finally in a way that's not, <laughs> that's not conflicting. And so I just, I'm loving creating these NFTs. I'm loving absolutely every single moment of it. And for me, it's, it's super exciting. That's fantastic. So Suki, what are your plans for the future? Wow. <laughs> um, Are they? <laughs> <to> the <moon. laughs> um, yeah, I have, I have a lot of things that I would like to do. Um, and a lot of, I suppose, a lot of thoughts I'd like to impart on the world. I'm, I don't profess to know all the answers, but I'd like to kind of create a legacy that maybe inspires people. That's something mm-hmm. that I want to do at the core of everything I do. And in terms of career-wise, I guess just literal 
career-wise, um, I've loved every element of burlesque. Mm -hmm. And I have reached these incredible heights in burlesque. And I'm sure burlesque will always be a part of my narrative. But what I've loved about burlesque, and that's kind of come through NFTs, but also through social media, is creating YouTube film video versions of my performances. And then being a part of Netflix and filming on a television set was, was, was so, so intense, but it was incredible because I knew that I wanted to be on a set and I wanted mm. to create in terms of that and I wanted to say more there. So I guess the direction now that I'm heading is definitely film and television. And I'm loving every single element of this new chapter. And I'm so excited because as a kid, I just, I just knew, <laughs> I knew that I was capable of venturing into something like film, um, but I guess I didn't have the confidence and now I feel all the support. And now I feel like I'm so ready. And so the next projects that you're going to see, some of which have been confirmed that I can't speak about yet, but will mm -hmm. soon. Um, and um, some of the projects that I'd love to do are definitely in the realm of film and television. And I'm excited to Well, that. don't forget Bollywood. <laughs> I'm going to oh, throw that Bolly in there. As, hey, as, as a, I love that you assumed that it was Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you assumed that it was Hollywood. No, me, for me, I mean, I grew up on, I mean, I grew up on Kuch Kuch Hotahe. I grew up prancing around wanting to be Shah Rukh Khan's sidekick. I mean, I really, That's really so did funny. that for me because I'm so expressive and having that dance background. My, my young film experiences are all Indian film and Bollywood. They're all that. Um, so there's like a couple of people that I just really want to work with and I'm excited to work with in Bollywood. And so well, I very much hope that people. happens for you. So <laughs> very exciting. No, listen, that's amazing. And um, we're going to take a quick break and I'm going to come back and uh, we have a, a rapid fire where uh, we talk about all the things non burlesque and nothing that you're, you're doing right now and uh, pick your brains about that. So uh, we'll I'm be ready. right back. Hey, everybody, let me tell you a little bit about what happened on the IVM Podcast Network this week. If you are a fan of the network, you should definitely check out Nan Karit. Sadaf and Archit were joined by Keshav Chaturvedi of the Tere Mere Raste podcast. They talk about travel and food and, you know, I mean, like how important food is when you're considering travel. It's a really, really interesting conversation. Do check that out. Let me give you another couple of quick hits to check out on Storytellers and Storytellers. Vineet talks to Ashim Mathur from Dolby. On Smarter with Sid, Siddharth examines how Netflix is getting into e-commerce. Check out Misconduct with Raghavi and Nisha to learn about some of India's most famous criminals. And don't forget, do follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram to keep up with what's going on on the network. And finally, I'd like to thank the sponsors of the network this week. They are what makes this possible. Thank you so much, Siad, Cred, Global Victoria, Bank of Baroda, Intuit, and Lenovo. We really do appreciate the support. Welcome back. I'm here with the very exciting Suki Menon, and we have been talking all things burlesque. But um, Suki, what is your one go-to comfort food? Uh, donuts. Why? I have to. I'm a restauranter. <laughs> oh my gosh, donuts. I'm so sorry, but I'm not talking about like basic donuts. I'm talking about donuts. Very, oh, very donuts. Very. I thought you said don't ask. So I was oh, like, no. oh, I will ask. Please do, do ask. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> don't ask because there's donuts. so many donuts. Um, Amazing. Donuts. So you have a bit of a sweet donuts. tooth, do you? Absolutely. Like Valapam donuts. Oh my God. Or some like, <laughs> oh my goodness. I have the most sweet tooth. But right now, I mean, it really changes on the day and where I am and which country I'm in. But right now, these, are they called crispy cram donuts? Crispy, these donuts, I'm not sponsored by them to say that, but these donuts are just like <laughs> my demise. <laughs> okay, um, who have been your role models? Um, so many people, Maya Angelou, Barbara Young, um, obviously SRK, Will Smith, Jada Pinkett Smith, Jay Shetty, um, so many people, yeah. Yeah. If not a burlesque dancer, what? would you be? I guess I answered my own question in life. It turns out I'd be an IT nerd, but I <laughs> if, I, if I wasn't a burlesque artist, I'd be something else artistic. 
Yeah, okay. Um what's the philosophy you live by? Be kind, be honest, do good, make a difference. Amazing. So Ki, thank you so much for being on the show and thank I you. really wish you the very best and I hope you continue to raise the temperatures and leave a mark wherever you go. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Suki really sounds like an incredible young lady who has truly found her one true love against all odds. What she's doing through her profession has got me thinking too about what more I could be doing for women in our industry. Hopefully, I'll have more to share with you on that soon. I hope you enjoyed tuning in today. Do catch the earlier episodes when you get a chance and more importantly, I would love to hear from you with your thoughts on the show. You can find me on Instagram at Gauri Devi Deyal. or on twitter at gory details or linkedin either way sit back and relax cuz this round is on me eventually you see the end of your childhood get accustomed to womanhood enjoy the experience of sisterhood might get to wifehood or not choose motherhood or not You learn to define your personhood, earn a livelihood, change the neighborhood, and get rid of the falsehood that life post academia is easy. So join me, Ritasha, and me, Ayushi, on a journey from station starting point to station um what now? Next station, Pudding Station, and hopefully Agla Station, adulthood. Fresh episodes out every Thursday. Working Monday to Friday glued to your chair making you feel dull? Worry not. Get your 5 minute weekly dose of travel around the world with postcards from nowhere. Join me every Thursday as I explore the strange, obscure and fascinating parts of the world and bring out facets of travel you may not have thought of before. You can find us on the IBM Podcast app, website or wherever you get your podcast from.